Education. Why do students in some countries thrive while others lag behind? We'll talk to educators in Hong Kong and South Korea, to world leaders. And later, what can be done about the more than 28 million children living in countries affected by conflict who are denied access to learning? Hello, I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C., and this is The Heat. When the Influential Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development released its study on global education late last year, the results were startling. Finland and South Korea remain among the education superpowers, topping the latest test results, with both in the top six for reading and math, and Finland near the head of the class in science. Among other strong performers, Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand, and Japan. But among the surprises, the United States, dropping to 31st place in math, trailing such nations as Slovakia, Portugal, and Vietnam, while American high school students fell to 24th in science and 21st in reading. Sobering news for a country that spends 7.3% of its gross domestic product on education from pre-kindergarten through university level. That's the fifth highest in the world. So what does it all mean? Why are some countries succeeding while others lag behind? Later, we'll talk to an advocate for reform in the United States and an educator in South Korea. But we begin in Hong Kong and the Secretary for Education, Eddie In Hakim. Thanks for joining us, Eddie. Uh, when we look at these international assessments or standardized tests that are done around the world, Hong Kong students do extremely well. They've, Hong Kong has emerged as one of the uh, world leaders when it comes to education. To what do you attribute the success? I believe um, Hong Kong has been doing pretty well for the last two rounds of assessment. We call it PISA, Program for International Student Performance. If you look at the, uh, the result of it, and this improvement between the last one versus the latest one, mark the year, 20, uh, year 2012. And uh, number two uh, in the world on both the reading as well on science. And uh, number third in terms of the mathematics. If you ask me, why are we doing that well? I think there would be a, a few reasons for that. The first one relates to the curriculum because so since year 2000, and uh, we have a team of uh, expertise in Hong Kong drafting the uh, education reform for the next 10, 15 years. And since then, we've been conducting a lot of the education reform in various stages of the education, all the way from the primary school, secondary education, to the tertiary. And this continual, what I call continual improvement and continual renewal, constant renewal, I believe is the first reason. What we are trying to do is trying to find ways to do better every day. So that's the first. Second one relates to the, uh, the, the, the fortune we have of uh, a big team of uh, very dedicated teachers who are very professional, who work very hard and dedicated for the benefit interests of the students. They've been doing a lot of uh, self-improvement, sharing of a uh, teaching and learning process, starting uh, with the uh, self-improvement, the continual professional development programs every year. Right. Uh, for the teachers, every three years, they need to come up with 150 hours of uh, professional development. Right. You know, in 1997, of course, Hong Kong uh, became independent. Uh, it got its independence from Britain. At that point, did Hong Kong have to change its education system completely? Did you have to redevelop, start a new education system? Or does what you have now, basically, is it a hybrid between what the British left you, the legacy of the British system, and developing something new? Uh, right after the 1997, uh, life continues as uh, it has been until year 2000. We believe it's time to have an uh, overhaul of, the, uh, of what the education will be heading for the next 10 years. That's why the, the year 2000 marked a major year of uh, review. 
It has nothing to do with the 1997 return to the uh, motherland. Rather, it's an ongoing education reform process for the, uh, the last several years of Hong Kong. Now, in the 60s, the education system was based largely on, I guess, what you call rote learning or drills. Uh, has that changed in any significant way? And, I mean, do you place emphasis now on things like multidimensional thinking or, or what is known as critical thinking? Um, before the education reform, we had the problem of uh, overemphasis in terms of examination, and students would spend too much time focusing on either the science stream or the art stream, and then uh, with or without attending to their own interests and ability. That had changed. Since the uh, year 2000, we marked the uh, reform, and in the year 2009, actually we insert a new senior secondary curriculum, as you described, described that as, a much broader base. Instead of just a traditional Chinese English as the language subjects, mathematics, and around 10 to 20 standard option or choices, like a, uh, physics, chemistry, and so on, we had a major reform of the curriculum since uh, 2009. From then on, we had four, we have uh, four compulsory subjects, acting on other than English, Chinese, mathematics. We also have the liberal studies. Reason for that compulsory subject, liberal studies, to ensure we enrich every student's common sense, the sense of independent thinking, sense of a logic, as well as sense of confidence. And then we also have about 20 elective subjects for uh, students to choose. On top of that, we believe the world is moving multi-dimensions. That's why we provide another 37 applied learning subjects of all kinds. Some of those would have the uh, professional stream. Some of those would have uh, like a, a vocational stream. On top of that, Hong Kong has been very much uh, bilingual. We would like to offer students another option of trilingual. Right. Therefore, we also offer additionally six other languages yes. for students to choose. Okay. Now, uh, what about the use of technology in schools? How much emphasis do you place so on this? So this would be, this is, yeah, good question. What, what's important is we had spent uh, 15 years for the last five-year plan, so three of the five-year plans now is 15 years gone, in terms of the IT and education uh, programs. And uh, we spent almost like um, 9 billion Hong Kong dollar just for that reasons, over a billion US, uh, 1.2 billion US, trying to make sure the schools would have phase one, building of infrastructure, hardware in particular, second, the readiness of teachers and schools. Third, in terms of the piloting, experimenting of the new technologies and the deployment of it. Yeah, I just want to get one other question then and ask you, you know, what do you think countries like the United States can learn from the Hong Kong experience? I believe the uh, couple areas I think we can share more between the, the two places. The first one is Hong Kong really focusing on continuous and constant renewal. This uh, never stops. Second, Hong Kong has uh, launched a very strong engagement uh, uh, arrangement as an operating style in running the education services here. Everyone gets involved, including the parents, students, teachers, alumni, as well as school management. The third thing I get that important is the commitment from the government. The education we spend uh, would uh, contribute to around 21.8 percent of the total government spending, okay. the largest spender, so to speak, in the government here for okay. several years. Okay, I want to get one other question, and that is, you know, a little later in the program, we're going to have a report from South Korea where, you know, you're finding that there's a lot of pressure uh, from parents and from the education system on students themselves. Uh, you know, pressure to succeed and parents needing to spend more money on their children's education as well. Uh, do you have that similar kind of problem in Hong Kong? 
we had that problem before and uh, we still have that problem right now, what we are trying to do is trying to understand what does that mean. Parents' expectation on students would be one of the key areas. That's why when we are conducting the education reform right now, we put a lot of eco emphasis in terms of parental education and parental engagement so that they understand it. We also try to have the round table between students and parents in a big group so that they talk to each other as well. These are two areas to make sure parents with more information, direct information, to ease their mind. Okay, so we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. We are going to take a break right now. But coming up later, what can be done about the 28 million children living in conflict zones who are denied access to learning? And up next, we'll take a look at another leading country in education, South Korea. But does that success in South Korea come at a cost? We'll talk to advocates for education reform in both South Korea and the United States. That's when the heat continues. Stay with us.